Romans chapter number one. What a list of things from which to be delivered. All right, Romans 1, verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, that's not me, I like to keep God in my thoughts. Uh, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Life is much more difficult living in sin than living God's way. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Fornication, we talked about that last uh, Thursday evening. Wickedness, we talked about that on Sunday evening. And tonight, covetousness. And everybody said, good, finally one I don't need any instruction on at all. <laughs> covetousness. To covet is to eagerly wish for something or to have a strong desire to obtain or possess. Two times in the Bible it's used in a good way. Everywhere else it's something surely to be avoided. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter number 5 and we'll allow God's Word to explain to us, show us exactly what He means covetousness. Now remember back in Romans 1, uh, what was the, the root problem? They, they were not thankful. As a result of not being thankful, they sank into covetousness. And so I can be occupied today, tonight, tomorrow with all of the wonderful things God has given me. Or I can be occupied with something either that God has not given me or something God gave someone else. I, I could sure be full of joy if I was occupied with all the great blessings that God's bestowed upon my life. And I could sure be continually discontented if all I thought about was what I don't have or what you have or what I wish I had or why did God give that to him and not to me. And you can see how, again, whether our mind is on the Lord or our mind is reprobate, it, it doesn't change anything in our lives except our lives. All the externals remain the same. I have what I have. I don't have what I don't have. But I can have what I have and not have what I don't have with great thanksgiving and rejoicing if I'm occupied with what God's given me. Or I can, I can live the same life under the same circumstances in misery if all I do is spend my day looking at the advertisements for things I can't afford and things somebody else has and look across the street at what the neighbor has and, and uh, look at the, you understand what the Lord's saying here. Deuteronomy 5, these are known as the Ten Commandments, uh, just the first of many. But in this list of commandments, God says in verse number 21, neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house. So what is covet? It is desire. What is desire? It is covet. Uh, house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything, or anything that is thy neighbor's. It belongs to someone else. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to someone else. It doesn't belong to me. If I set my heart upon what belongs to someone else, think of all the terrible paths that open up before me. Bitter against God. Bitter against that man. Plotting to take away from that man what he has. That could lead to stealing. It could lead to adultery. It could lead to murder. There's there's really not a lot of good, positive possibilities that can come from desiring someone else's possessions, coveting what someone else has. Look in your Bible uh, just uh, not too many pages back in Exodus chapter 18. Exodus 18. Moses is bearing all the responsibility for ministering and judging and overseeing the great multitude of Israelites that have come out of Egypt. 
And Jethro, his father-in-law, offers him a suggestion. And that suggestion is to, to find some people to help him do the work. And the uh, Bible says here in verse number uh, 13, It came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto even? And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people uh, come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and His laws. That's what right judging is. It's not, I think you're right, and I think she's wrong, and I think he should have the favored position. I think, uh, that, no, it's, well, here's what God said in His Word about what you're doing and about what you're doing, and that's, that's proper judgment. It's the same in the New Testament. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, dare ye, what Christian would dare to go before an unjust judge to get a ruling on whether something is right or wrong? Any Christian would bring a matter of, of dispute before the church so the church can point out what the Bible says. When somebody opts for a law court rather than a church hearing, they've already decided they want to go against the Word of God. What, what, what I don't believe in judging. Well, well then you don't, you don't believe in going by the Bible. In the Bible, we're supposed to judge. We're supposed to judge righteous judgment. That is, you hear this side and you hear that side, and then you go to the Scripture and you tell both sides, this is what the Bible says. Which is why the courtrooms are full and the church houses are empty. People don't want to do what the Bible says. Anyway, so verse 17, Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away, both thou and this people that is with thee. For this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of ten, and let them judge the people at all seasons. And it should be that every great matter they should bring unto thee, but every small matter they should judge, so shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. Now, whether or not God sent this man to give Moses these instructions has been debated ever since this happened, ever since this passage is written. That's not our, our topic of conversation this evening. Jethro expresses great wisdom and understanding here. You cannot put a man in a position to rule as a judge or a governor or a, an interpreter of the law over the people if he is a covetous man. It will open him to bribery. It will open him to corruption. It will open him to... Um, viewing one party differently than the other based upon what they might be able to offer him or to do for him. It will result in uh, the U.S. Congress, the U.S. Senate, the state legislators. You know, your problem is not that you don't have a great system of laws. Your problem is that those laws are being administered and interpreted by people who are covetous. They have enriched themselves at the expense of the people to whom they're supposed to be ministering, and they have, they have uh, made prey of the people they're supposed to be serving. So what the Bible says here is, if you want to make right decisions, a desire and an appetite for money and property and possessions will get in your way. It will hinder you. It will, it will cause you to make bad decisions. You know, when we're, uh, we're talking to these young people and they, they uh, you know, come of age and they, the boys start to notice the girls and the girls start to notice the boys and they start talking about uh, who they might marry or not marry, this and that. Um, 
The first thing we always talk to them about is the spiritual condition of the other person. Not the, not the size of the bank account. And there's been many persons that their, their basis, their, their, uh, the, the, the factor by which they judged or determined whether or not someone would be a good prospect was the size of the house or the cost of the car or the, 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 uh, you know, the income, that sort of thing. Now listen, uh, it's important. It's important that a man be able to provide for a woman. He can't pay his own rent and buy his own groceries. He's not ready to get married. But, but this, this idea that you're going to be happy if you marry money, and if you can't marry enough money, you're not going to be happy, that covetousness is, is going to cloud your judgment. And the Lord says, that, well, it's, and church matters. We'll get to that in a little bit. But you just, you cannot believe the number of things that preachers are sure are wrong until a rich man does them. And the number of things a preacher stands against until the, the big givers in the church start standing on the other side. And covetousness will cloud your judgment. It's not a good thing to live your life desiring uh, someone else's possessions or a greater measure of material possessions. Look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And I believe our verse is Psalm 119, number, yes, 36. Psalm 119, verse 36. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. Now we talked uh, in that message on fornication, we talked about influences. We talked about influences. And uh, there, there's uh, plenty in this world to influence our hearts, to have our hearts leaning, inclining in the direction of covetousness and very little in this world that would cause you to lean in the direction of God's words. You know that's true. Now, if we owned a radio station and we didn't have millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars, we would have to sell advertising time on that radio station in order to keep it on the air. That's, that's how commercial radio works. You could have a public radio where you don't have to sell ads because you can just steal the money from um, conservative right-thinking people and make them pay for liberal communist propaganda. Uh, but that's, uh, we're not talking about government stuff. We're talking about you know, uh, capitalism, real, real free market. You've got to sell ads on radio, television. Uh, the, the billionaires own these TV stations and networks, but they didn't get to be billionaires by giving it away. And so they're going to sell advertising time. Now, so here's what you get if you listen to the radio all day. Here's what you get if you watch TV all day. You get a little bit of quote-unquote entertainment sandwiched in between a non-stop reminder that you don't yet have what you need to be happy. You don't yet have what you need to be safe. You don't yet have what you need to enjoy life. You don't yet have what you need to be able to dine at our restaurant and eat our ice cream, and enjoy our chips, and drink our Coca-Cola, and lose weight fast. <laughs> it's just one ad stacked on top of another to remind you that, oh, did you know that you know these? Are you aware that you haven't enjoyed this? Here's a place you haven't been yet. Here's a way you could get ripped off that you haven't thought about yet. And so there is this continual presentation through the media of this world of why you can't be happy yet, why you can't be satisfied yet, why you couldn't possibly be content because you haven't yet bought this. You know what that is? The more of that you, you occupy yourself with, the more your heart and mind is going to be inclined in the direction of covetousness. Now, just, please, just, just for a minute, just think with me, just for a minute, please. Your, your 
forefathers and foremothers and ancestors, all, all those people way back there. Um, I, I, I really don't know. I thank God I don't. I really don't know what it took to get up in the morning and know there would be no bread if I didn't plant the grain, grow the crops, harvest the crops, grind the meal, knead the dough, bake the bread. I would have no butter if I didn't tend to the cow, milk the cow, churn the butter. You, you, I mean, life is so easy now. History of the world for people that live in this nation. So you live in a house, not a tent, not a hut. You live in a house, a climate-controlled house with plumbing, with a stove, with a microwave, with a refrigerator, and you sit in one of your many comfortable chairs with a device in front of you that costs a year's wages for many people in this world. And all day long as you sit there drinking sodas and eating chips and raising or lowering the thermostat in your comfortable chair, people come on that box and tell you why you don't have it all yet. You know, the le that level of covetousness is off the charts. <laughs> what more could you possibly want? Well, wait 30 seconds, we got another ad for you. How could you possibly complain about a life like this? Well, just hang on. At the next commercial break, we'll give you four reasons. Now, up against that, Hour after hour after hour after hour after hour of staring at that propaganda machine. You break away for an hour once a week to come to hear a preacher tell you from the Bible that Jesus Christ can give you joy and hope and contentment and satisfaction and that the Christian life is wonderful. But how can one sermon a week break through all of that cry to covetousness. And since most preachers feel so overwhelmed by the opposition of the world and its, and its cry for material things, they continually shorten the length of the sermon and increase the size of the coffee bar and the donut lounge Because if the world wants to be covetous and they don't want to incline themselves to the Bible, the only way we can finance this incredible mortgage that we have is to appeal to their covetousness, not to their need for the Word of God. We're up against it. So I want to do all that I can in my personal life to incline my heart to God and not to covetousness. And that requires me to spend more time with the Bible and less time with anything that has advertising. And more time with Christians who are serving God and less time with Christians who are griping. I don't want to spend my days with people who wish they had somebody else's better husband or somebody else's better wife or somebody else's better car or somebody else's better house or somebody else's better pastor. My heart doesn't need any help leaning in the wrong direction. I want to be with contented people. I want to be with people that are thanking God for their blessings. I want to be with people that are rejoicing in what God has given them, not with people who are constantly complaining about what Trump didn't do for them today. I mean, you knew it was going to happen. Eight years, Obama's the worst thing on earth. And it doesn't take six months until people realize Obama or Trump didn't change my life either. Who's the next guy? The next guy is the same as the last guy, Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ or disappointment. <laughs> Nobody can do everything for you that you want done for you because there's always something else you want done for you. <laughs> Read the verse again. 
Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. Whatever's in your life that's pushing you to be discontented and pushing you to want and pushing you to desire, you ought to turn away from that. And whatever you got in your life that's making you want more of Jesus and more of the Bible and more of Christian fellowship and more of souls won to, to the Lord, you ought to lean that way. Proverbs 28. Let's try that one. Proverbs 28. Covetousness. You've never seen a country with more that talks like they have less than this one. Proverbs 28. Verse number 16. The prince that wanteth understanding is also a great oppressor now watch this. But he that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days. Can you think of some way that covetousness might shorten your life? How about going after a co-worker's wife? How about extorting from money from the company and ending up spending 5, 10, 15 years in a prison house? How about just eating your insides alive while you gnaw on your dissatisfaction? This crummy little trailer and this broke down car and that good for nothing old man and that, that nagging wife and I, I sure wish I had, you sure wish you had what? That woman on TV, she's an actress. That's not a real person living a real life. I watch the reality shows. No, you don't. No, you don't. That's not reality. All that stuff is designed for you. I, I want to be, what, what's the, I think this show, these shows now, I, I haven't seen one of them, I haven't seen one minute of one of them. But they got these shows now where, where 25 harlots take turns fornicating with a man and then he decides which one he's going to marry at the end of the show. And you got, you got housewives and mothers and grandmothers sitting in their living room staring at that filth like they had good sense. Well, I sure wish I, you know, I wish I'd be on that show and he'd pick, pick me and I'd be, he ain't going to pick you. <laughs> Just sit there and dream. Well, I wish I could be that guy, man. 25 girls, I could fornicate with every one of them. Hey, you got a wife, stupid. Yeah. Turn off the TV and go yeah. enjoy the woman you fell in love with when you had sense. Yeah. Good. Country's messed up, man. Yes, sir. It is. Yeah. Totally messed up. You're going to shorten your life eating the bread of sorrows. You're going to shorten your life just, just rotting your insides, wishing you had what you're never going to have, yeah. and jealous and bitter against people that are never going to give you what you think they ought to give you. He daily loadeth us with benefits. How about that? Amen. Having food and raiment, lest therewith be content. I bet, I bet everybody here tonight is way past that. I guarantee you every one of us is so far from food and raiment only, we don't even know how far back the road that is. I'm telling you, you can think about all God's given you and all you got from God, or you can think about what somebody else has. One, one's going one's gonna to lead to real good life, and the other going to shorten your days. What if you live just as long? What if, what if you, you're going to die at 80, you still die at 80? But you just spent 35 years of your life just miserable. <laughs> I don't want to just be alive. I want life. I want life. Um, we don't have a big house. We got a house. We don't have a new car. We got a car. We don't have the best food money can buy. We got food and money to buy it. Praise the Lord. Man, I'd rather have leftovers three nights in a row than be able to afford steak and caviar and have ulcers from fretting over who's richer than I am and can't eat what I got in front of me. It's a fact, man. People just, they, they kill themselves. Hating people that have more than they have. 
And all these protesters and stuff in the, in the country, and all these gripers in the country, these, these TV crews go out and dredge them up, you know. They never interview these people on their job. Four generations you've had housing provided for you. Nobody in your family's worked in a hundred years. Free school, free transportation, free cell phones, free cable TV, free electricity, free food at the grocery store. We are oppressed. The man's holding us down. Shut your mouth. Don't you go somewhere and try oppression. Don't you go somewhere where you've got to earn your way through life. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter how much you give covetous people. They're just going to look at somebody who's got a little bit more than, than they do and be unhappy with it. That's a fact. Just a little preaching worked in there. Jeremiah chapter... Four or six, Jeremiah six. Of course, we'd go to the church house to be different there. Ha <laughs> ha. Jeremiah six. Jeremiah chapter six. You know, it's a funny thing. Uh, if I get anywhere near preaching about money, I see it in your faces. I I observe it in in your uh, squirmicity. It's a new word I just made up. Somebody will say something about it. This is the least money church you'll ever be in in your life. No offering plate. No, rarely a mention there's a box in the back. Some of you think it has electrical charge to it. If you touch it, it's going <laughs> to give you a thousand volts. But it, it won't hurt you, really, if you get, if you get near it. But... We, we, don't do, we don't do a Sunday school offering and then a church offering and then a missions offering and then have the kids run around and shake nickels out of you in case you got any coins left. We don't do that. But, I, but I'm telling you, there are, there are pastors in this world, nobody's ever given enough. There's never been a big enough offering. There's never been a large enough pledge. There's never been a big enough percentage of people. It, it is like 24 hours a day, that guy eats, drinks, sleeps, and thinks offerings. That's not, that's not spiritual. It's not right. Amen. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 6, and I'm, listen, I'm not against people taking up an offering. You do whatever you want. You can pass a plate. You can pass a bowl. You can pass a credit card reader. You can, you can put a box in the front, a box in the back. I don't care. And if you think it's wrong for, for churches to ask for your money, you're not reading the Bible. The first day of the week, every Christian was supposed to give in their church. That's a Bible. Oh, bless God, I'm a King James Bible believer. Not if you're not in church on Sunday giving money. You're not a King James Bible believer. That's what it says. So, so don't, don't try to blow oh, my preacher, oh, he wants my money. No, he doesn't, that's not all he wants, but he wants some of it. <laughs> Once in a while. <laughs> you see, <laughs> we'll get to the verse in a second. <laughs> Why is the preacher covetous if he asks you for your money, but you're not covetous if you refuse to give any of it? How come the only person in the church who's covetous is the pastor? Yeah, that's, that is good. Thank you. That's, 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 that's right. I can say that. Jeremiah 6. That's right. That's all, that's all I want is your money. Sherry's birthday this week. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 6, verse number 11. Therefore, I am full of fury, uh, full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife should be taken, the aged with him that is full of days, and their houses should be turned unto others uh, with their fields and wives together. If I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, every one is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, 
every one dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. You know what he said? The people loved money, and they didn't love God. All day long they thought about stuff and they didn't think about God. And the priests and the prophets would not point out to the people the peril they were in because it might cost them some money. The people are covetousness, the priests are covetous, the congregation's covetous, the prophets are covetous, and God said, all they want is stuff, I'll take all their stuff away from them. I'll burn their city to the ground, carry them into captivity as slaves. Then, then we'll see how that covetousness played out. How about that? Now I'm telling you right now, this country we live in, spiritually, it's a disaster. And the churches that are growing in this country are the ones where the preacher won't say a word about it. And the reason he won't say a word about it is he went to a seminar or read a book on how to use God's people to enrich yourself. That's right. Forty days of purpose and all that nonsense. You know all that is? It's marketing strategies to milk people for their cash. God, God said, Jeremiah 6, I'll burn it to the ground. How about that? Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 33. I, I, I'd rather hear some positive preaching. This is positive. I'm positive about every bit of this. No doubt in my mind, God's word is true. Ezekiel 33, verse number 30. Also, thou son of man, the children of thy people are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses and on Facebook. <laughs> well, that's, that's in the doors of the houses. And speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh from the Lord. They know Ezekiel is preaching the word of God. But as soon as he's done preaching, they start criticizing what he said and the way he said it, and the man for saying it. That's what you just read. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, out thou art unto them as a very lovely song, of one that hath pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument, for they hear thy words, but they do them not. So people come to church and the preacher preaches on witnessing. People say, that's right, that's the Bible, that's, that's what the Bible says. And then the preacher says, now tomorrow we're going to go out and tell people about Jesus. Well, I can't. It's a good sermon, but I, I, I can't. And next week people come and the preacher talks about missions and how we need to reach the world with the gospel and, and we're going to take up a, a, a missions offerings. People say, that was a great sermon. That was really true. I, it really touched my heart about those, those people over there in those faraway lands, but I don't have anything to give. And he gets in the car and goes down and eats out at the restaurant. So the preacher is telling the truth and the people, this is not, this is not atheists now. This is not People just dead set against God. These are people who come and hear the Bible and say, that's right, that's right, that's the Bible, that's right. But they won't do it because they're so committed to things and getting more and getting bigger and getting her and getting him and getting that that they just can't obey the Word of God. It's a fact. Now, some of you just getting started in life and, and some of you about to get married and all that sort of thing and some of you pretty far down the road. But I'm just going to tell you something. If you're 20 years old and want to serve God with your life, the, the, a surefire way to wreck that is just go ahead and get yourself in 20 years worth of debt. 
Because all those things you want to do for God, you won't be able to do for God because you've got to work that second job and that overtime and you've mortgaged yourself up to your eyeballs and you just, you're a slave. Borrower, servant to the lender. Okay? And listen, I, I've told everyone this, I've told all you men the same thing. If you've got to work 40 hours a week, if you can make 10 bucks an hour rather than five, make the 10 bucks an hour. I mean, you've got to go to work, make what you can. You've got to work the rest of your life, get some education, get some training where you have a good job, not a crummy job. But when you start buying stuff and, and, and locking yourself into stuff and making career choices until God is squeezed out of your life, that big house and that boat and that swimming pool and all the rest of that is not going to do for you what God would have done for you if you'd put him first. And there's some people, I, I'm telling you, I, I've, I've talked to them for, for decades. Preacher, I know you're right. Preacher, I'd love to do more for God. Preacher, I'd love to help my pastor out. But we're about to lose our home. Well, why'd you buy a house worth way more than you could ever pay for it? Well, we just wanted the, you know, the this and the that. I'm, I know, look, some of you building a house right now. I'm, I'm not against building a house. I got a house. I'm not against a car. I've got a car. But you ought to see the cars we drove. You ought to see the house we lived when we got married. I know everybody tells these stories. Oh, you're singing a sad story. I'm not singing a sad story. I'm just telling you. You can't let the lust of your flesh lock you up so for the next 30 years of your life you can't give yourself to God. Because the things you think are going to make you happy, when you get them, you're going to find out they don't make you happy. Especially at doubled down 19% interest on the credit card. If you want something, save the money. When you got the money, buy it. But that desire makes you go out and swipe that card and say, I'll pay it off someday. Probably not. Or three times over. Well, praise the Lord. It's trying to help. Acts chapter 20. Now, not everybody that is wrong. Some people do it right. Acts chapter 20, here's Apostle Paul. Remember him? Apostle Paul. We like Paul. We love Jesus and we like Paul. We trust Jesus and we learn from Paul. We follow Paul, but only as far as he follows Jesus. And when he goes off the rails, we stick with Jesus. But, but Paul's a pretty good guy. Verse, uh, Acts 20, verse 22, And now, behold, I go bound to the Spirit on Jerusalem in disobedience. I just believe in following Paul. Well, that's a bad idea. Because right here he's messing up. Now behold, I go bound in the Spirit on Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. How can you not know, Paul? God's told you half a dozen times. Every town you've gone to, God's told you what's going to happen to you if you go to Jerusalem. Even Paul can lie to himself. <laughs> well, I just, we just go by Paul. Well, you're crazy. Sorry, that's another topic for another night. 23, save that the Holy Ghost witnessed every city, the bonds and afflictions abide me. Isn't that funny? I don't know what's going to happen there, but here's what the Holy Ghost said. <laughs> but but may, maybe I get around it. <laughs> maybe when I get there, it'll work out better than God said it would. <laughs> you better learn something from that. God's told you not to do something. Don't think you're going to go do it and then God's going to come make it all right. All right, anyway, but none of these things move me. Sometimes they should. Now the count on my life, dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry, so I have received the Lord Jesus, testify the gospel of grace of God. And so he says, you're not going to see me anymore. Now watch what he says about his ministry among them. 31. Therefore, watch, remember, by space three years, I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. He doesn't clock out after eight hours. 
Night and day, he's at it. And now, brethren, I commend you the grace to uh, God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, give you an inheritance among the, all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, I said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So he gave, he worked, he gave away what he worked for, and then he worked some more. But here's what he said. You know, you know, the whole time I was with you, I did nothing with an angle to get your gold. And I did nothing to manipulate the situation to get your silver. And I never dropped any hints or played the sad violin to get you to buy me a new suit of clothes. I worked and labored and told you about Jesus. Now, doesn't that sound a lot better than that bunch in Jeremiah and Ezekiel? Yes, sir. Isn't that the way it ought to be? There's nothing wrong with gold. God's got lots of it. There's nothing wrong with silver. God's got almost as much of that as he has gold. Amen. Nothing wrong with apparel. Man, God dressed up his priests in the Old Testament. He dresses up his saints in heaven. Hallelujah. It's not the stuff. It's the heart desiring the stuff. It's that constant longing for what you don't have instead of that dedication to what you do have. Come on, honestly. Just honestly tonight. I, I, just about everybody here, God's given you a family. How long has it been since you just enjoyed your family? Instead of having to go get something else with your family or for your family. God's given you salvation. How long has it been since you just enjoyed your salvation instead of going to God asking for some more stuff? You healthy tonight? How long has it been since you just enjoyed being well? I'm telling you, we, we got all these great things. I love this church. I love the people of this church. I love the activity of this church. I love the... the, the uh, how long has it been since you just enjoyed your church? And I wish we had this. I wish we had that. I wish we did this different. I wish we had that different. I wish he wasn't there. I wish they weren't there. I wish they'd come. I wish, yeah, but how about everything that's good about it? That desire for what we don't have and that desire for what the other person has, it shortens our days because it just rips our days right away from us. We can't enjoy what we have for thinking about what we don't have. Paul said, man, I was there, I was there just, just all in to the ministry and what enabled me to go night and day, day and night is I just, I just wasn't sitting around wishing I had that guy's gold and wishing I had that guy's silver and wishing I could afford clothes as nice as that fella had. Praise God. I see, man, I, some of you pull up in the parking lot and I, I said, who's driving that? Man, that's a nice rig. I'd like to have a rig like that. And I would. But that's the last time I'll think about it. Somebody said, well, you could afford that. No, you mean I could make payments on that. <laughs> just, I mean, I, we're not going to get into all that. I'm just telling you. It, and, and, and when you walk in the door, so, oh, I got that, got that big, nice car out there. Here I'm the man of God. And I don't have a big, nice car like that. You ought to get rid of that big, nice car. Look, I don't care if you have a big, nice car. I'm glad you got a big, nice car. The bigger it is, the better able it is to jumpstart mine. You understand what I'm saying? I, I, look, I, I, I'll go to some of your houses, and I, what my wife was sent away home. Man, that's a nice house. That's a nice house. That was a nice this, that was a nice that. I mean it. 
But I'm gonna lay up at night. So I said, well, I have a house like that. I have a house like that. I don't mean to be the bigger the house, the more windows there are to clean, the more floor there is to mop, and all, the, all those other things I have to do every week. <laughs> all right, every now and then. <laughs> now, you know what I'm saying? Don't be bitter against somebody that gets to go out to eat at a big, fancy, expensive restaurant where the steak costs twice as much and is half the size. And it goes fast because you don't have to chew it for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. What's it to you? What do you care how much somebody else's shoes cost? Why is, it, why is it going to ruin your day? You, are you saved? You washed in the blood? You got eternal life? You're not going to hell? What do you care what, what somebody paid for their earrings? How big somebody's wedding ring is? Or engaged, who, what do you care? The more you care about that, the more unhappy you're going to be with everything you got. It's just a fact. So look, somebody's always going to be richer than you. I don't care how rich you are, somebody's going to be richer than you. I don't care where you go, somebody's been there first and stayed longer. I'm telling you, I learned that. Some of you are not going to like this, but I, you know, for, for a few years there, before both my shoulders went dead, um, I played the sport for people who can't play sports anymore. Uh, golf. <laughs> and uh, and, and I, I, I became friends with, without, without controversy, the richest men in this county. Friends because I'm such a nice guy, and, and I got to witness to him, telling him about Jesus, and I, I'm telling you this is the absolute truth. Two guys in this county, this, this is a decade ago now, and they were always arguing about which one of them was the richest man in the county. And this man went out, and he bought a, a Bentley automobile, blue and silver trim, for $180,000 to drive around. Now, I'll tell you how little I care. I didn't know what a Bentley was <laughs> until he told me what it was. Bentley sounds to me like the guy would open the door to the car and close it for you. But, but <laughs> what do I know? So, the, so this other guy who thought he was the richest man in the county, he went to the dealer and he said, I want you to order me the exact car he bought, and I want you to charge me $1 more than he paid. That's a fact. I witnessed that guy for years. I, w I witnessed to him in hospice just before he died. Tried to, tried to win him to the Lord. He told me one time, he, he, said, he said, where you live? I told him, he said, that's a swamp, isn't it? I said, yeah, it's, it's a swamp. And uh, he said, how, how big's your house? I said, 1,200 square feet. He laughed. He said, he said, the master bedroom in my third house is bigger than your whole house. And I said, yeah, but I'm happy in mine. So you talk to a rich man like that? I talk to everybody like that. <laughs> I'm no respecter of persons. <laughs> I'm just telling you, that man was looking for satisfaction that I had. Yeah. Yeah. And he's looking for contentment that I had. And I, I don't begrudge him the, the junk that he came in one day, and uh, he's all bragging I, and I, and about something. And I told him, I said, man... I cannot believe they did that to you. What are you talking about? I said, I, I, I want to be there when you call them because that, that's just awful. He said, what? I said, you know that building you gave Stetson they put your wife's name on it? Yeah. I said, you, they could at least spell their name right. Oh, man, I thought he was going to have a heart attack. Right? <laughs> I said, man, there, our name is on the side of that building. He said, are you kidding me? I said, yeah. <laughs> Give him a business. If you're rich, God bless you. Hope you're happy. If you're poor, God bless you. Hope you're happy. Don't sit there and be jealous of that rich person. They might be less content with life than you are. You look at all the stuff Solomon had and read Ecclesiastes. Who'd want to be that guy? All right, anyway, we've got to press ahead here. 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6. I hope every one of you gets a raise this year. 
I do, I do. I hope every one of you gets, you know, a little more fun times and all that. I'm, I'm not against all that. <coughs> Till the day it gets to be your excuse for not serving God, then you've got a problem. You guys want to be missionaries. You better thank God everybody in every church isn't poor. Poor people ain't going to get you to the mission field. <laughs> Amen. I don't, I don't mean, listen, I don't mean this in a bad way at all, but I'm just telling you, some of God's people think it's a sin to have anything and to have money, and they get all, you know, act like they're spiritual because they dropped out of school and never got a decent job. And that, makes, that don't make you spiritual. But I, this is a nice building. It is, a nice building. Air conditioning, heat, all that, praise the Lord. Something breaks down, we call somebody, come fix it. Praise God. That ain't done with the five bucks you drop in every three weeks. No, no offense, but you got to get over this attitude that if somebody's got something nicer than you, they're not right with God or God should take it away from them because you don't have it. You know what that is? That's covetousness. And it's hurting you. That attitude's hurting you. It hurts a rich man to think he's better than you because he's rich, but it hurts you to turn up your nose and everybody's got a nicer house than you do or wears nicer clothes than you wear. That ain't right. Well, he just got that money because you know, his dad left him that money. Well, what do you wish, his dad been a drunk? What's your problem? So you're unhappy with that man because his mother wasn't a drug addict and his father wasn't a drunk and they worked all their life and took care of their money and loved their kids enough to give them some of it. Why you got a problem with that? Turn off the TV. The television's making you think that way. I saw somebody, people send me all this stuff, you know. Some guy had on a t-shirt and it said, Mad Wives Matter. <laughs> That's his new protest group. It wasn't, wasn't Black Lives Matter, it was Mad Wives Matter. <laughs> I don't care how rich you are, man. You got to go home to strife and contention and bitterness. and uh, Who wants that? All right. Got to press on here. 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, 4. Four, no, verse 9, verse 9. For they that will be rich. He didn't say rich. He didn't say poor. He said those that are inclined to think day and night about being rich. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. You can't afford your rent. Why are you buying lottery tickets? Because you will be rich. And now you're ensnared by a gambling addiction. See that? The guy right now, right now he's got a good job, making good money, got a good family, got a decent house. But he saw this thing on the internet where, where somebody could get him 20% interest in three months on an investment. Why don't you call your pastor and ask him if he thinks whoever put that on there is looking out for you. For your desire to be rich. Get you a snare. I used to think that whole thing was a fake about that guy in Nigeria that wanted to give you 30 some million dollars till he ended up in the White House. <laughs> How many remember those emails? <laughs> anyway, which drowned men in destruction and perdition. Now watch, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money, the love of money. Not the lack of money. That's what Reverend Ike used to preach on it. Radio, the lack of money is the root of all evil. No, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some, watch, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. You trade living for Jesus for trying to get rich, and here's where it ends up. 
and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You'll be sorry. You'll be sorry if you quit on Jesus to try and get rich. That's what the Bible said. Just go by the Word of God. All right. Uh, oh, we got lots of time. Romans 7. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Now don't limit this thing to, to money. Tell you what else that TV will do for you and that internet will do for you. You know, you know ladies, the, the, the more of these um, specially chosen by the millionaire manipulators the more of those fellows you watch act and sing and dance and commentate, the less you're going to be content with that fellow you're married to. That's a fact. Gentlemen, the more, you, the more time you spend looking at those women, and those movies, and those TV shows, and those websites, less content you're going to be with a woman you beg God to, to give you as a wife. Oh God, I can't live without her, please. Oh God, please let her say yes, I want her more than anything in the world. Well, then act like it. Amen. How are we doing? Amen. Get your eyes off everybody else's stuff and get your eyes on your stuff and start enjoying your stuff. Amen. Even if he's stuffed. <laughs> I love my husband and there's so much more of him to love than there used to be <laughs> amen what's the difference between a husband and a boyfriend four sizes <laughs> We've just, we won't even go the other way tonight Romans 7, verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Now doesn't covet sound like a not so bad word? Doesn't lust sound exactly like you know it to be? And Romans 7, 7 says covetousness is lust and lust is covetousness. Romans 13, verse 9. Romans 13, 9. I'm hurrying, I'm hurrying. Romans 13, verse 9. Romans 13, 9. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt, uh, shalt not kill, shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. If there be another commandment is briefly comprehend this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You love your neighbor, you won't take his wife. Love your neighbor, you won't steal his money. See, I mean, we, we get all these commandments because we don't have enough love in our heart. The more love we get in our heart, the more we can get rid of the commandments. Because where there's love, you don't need the commandment. But it's a lack of love in my heart that makes me think evil of you or act evil toward you because I want your stuff. Fair enough. Luke 12. No, no, before we do Luke, let's, let's do uh, Colossians 3. Colossians chapter 3. I, I don't think. Now, I've not been to everybody's house. I don't think anybody here has an idol in their home, I hope. Shrine, statue, uh, you know, God, goddess, figurine, thing you bow down to. We're not idolaters, praise the Lord. This soldier went to church on, on the base and the preacher got up and preached on the Ten Commandments. He named them all and he, he read the riot act. On the way out the door, that fellow, big smile on his face, says, preacher, I just want you to know I've never made a graven image. I mean, pick the one you haven't done and latch on to that. I don't think we're a crowd that commits idolatry around here. Or maybe we are. 
Colossians 3, verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Wow. Wow. I've never made a golden calf, but I sure, I sure want the gold. How about that? I never made an image, but I sure wish I had his image or her image instead of the one God gave me. Oh, uh, wanting what somebody else has is not the way to be happy. Luke 12, Luke 12, Hebrews 13. Finish up with this. Luke 12, Hebrews 13. And I'll, I'll tell you a story came, but just came to my mind, and we'll wrap up with that. Luke 12, Hebrews 13. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. He said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. If things become your life, you won't have a life. You'll have things. I can prove that. I can prove that. Um, we we go. We go, seem like we go through so many of these um, situations where somebody dies. And I'm telling you right now, right now, somebody in this town is in hospice or at home or in the hospital, and they got two days to live. You know what they want? Son, daughter, grandchildren, mama. Daddy, they don't want the riding mower. They don't want the golf clubs. They don't, want, they don't want any of the stuff from the garage or the house. They want the people. Man, don't wait till you're on your deathbed to realize the people in your life matter more than the stuff in your life. Don't wait till you're dying to figure that out. Hebrews 13, Hebrews 13, verse number 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Whatever you don't have, you got Jesus. Whatever you have, you can lose, but you can't lose him. <clears throat> just seemed like start to finish that Bible. It said we just keep our mind on the Lord and what we have in Christ. We'd be a lot happier if we got our mind on all these material things that we don't have or the things that other people have. So, I'm, uh, I'm 20, 20 years old, 20 years old, and the Bible school I was attending came up with a great way to get me off campus, and they sent me up an uh, hour and a half north of the campus. Uh, they rented a building and, and got a little apartment up there uh, so I could start a church. Great idea, great idea. Send a, send a 20-year-old single guy to a town to start a church. And so there I was, and that apartment was, um, was about 12 by 12, whole thing. That had a little wall right here, a divider, and there was a, a shower, a little walk-in shower thing and a, and a uh, commode, and then on the other side was a little refrigerator, microwave combination thing. That was called the kitchen. And then uh, the living room was the bedroom and the den and the dining room and the, and the guest room and the sun room and the moon room, and, the, and there it was. And the whole apartment full of druggies and drunks and prostitutes and everything else. I mean, every place my mom ever told me to stay away from, there I was living there for Jesus, you know. And, and so I'm out knocking on doors for months and months and months. I got one pair of shoes and, and 
cardboard. I'm not, I'm not, it's not a sad story. I'm just telling you. It had a pair of shoes, cardboard in them because of holes in the bottom. And I got one pair of dress pants that I, I wouldn't wear today if you paid me to wear them. Nice double knit, you know, walk by something and a big thread pulls out of them and all that. I don't know why people didn't come to church. I might as well tell them about Jesus. And, so anyway, I'm, just, I'm knocking on doors I, and by myself, day after day, by myself, four or five, six hours a day, then drive down there, go to school at night, come home, study for tests, get up next day, knock on doors. Anyway, so I get in this one neighborhood, and it's just big brick house, you know, North Carolina, big brick house, next yard, big brick house, next yard, big brick house. And all those people just sneer at you, slam the door in your face, you walk back down that long driveway, and here's all the landscape evergreens and all the rest of it, you know, and I'm about worn out with it. I walked up, knocked on this door, and this woman comes to the door, and I said, I'm here to tell you about Jesus Christ, how you can be saved, have eternal life. That woman, I mean for a fact, she stepped out of that door, and she looked at her house, and she looked across her yard, and then she looked at me just like I'm the most pathetic thing on earth, and she said, I have all I need. Man, I, I was done. That's it. I, I was done. I'm going back to that apartment and sitting there by myself and eat hot dogs out of the microwave. And I'm walking down that driveway just, I don't know what I'm going to do the rest of my life, but it ain't going to be this. And then God, remember him? And God just gets in your heart. And I got to in that driveway, I turned around and I said, hey, lady, I got all I need. And I went home happier than she was inside that mansion house. And by the grace of God, still doing it 40 years later. And I thank God I'm not living in that apartment building anymore. Amen. Praise the Lord. Don't have druggies and all that stuff around me. And I got coyotes and wild hogs. <laughs> but you can shoot them. <laughs> Of course, I don't know. You might, you might get in more trouble shooting them than. <laughs> anyway, I'm just telling you, uh, you get your eyes on what other people have, it'll break your heart. You get your eyes on what you have in Jesus Christ, what God's given to you, it'll keep you going. And that's just, you pick one way or the other to live. But, but uh, covetousness is a part and parcel of a reprobate mind. Because it means you've forgotten to be thankful for everything you have in Christ. Let's not be that way. We've got, we got a lot to be thankful for. Every one of us. Amen. All right, Father, thank you.